Hello everyone, I am Aldo Comi from Socament. Here with me there is uh, Nicolo Golinelli, our research analyst. Hi Nick. Hello, hello everyone. Okay, good guys, so today we will narrow our analysis uh, down to one of the most uh, debated uh, matrix uh, in football, expected goals. Somebody loves them, um, many people hate them. We will try to understand uh, why with this video. And uh, we will do it with the help of uh, James Tippett, who is the author of two books uh, on, the, on the subject. The first book uh, is uh, The Football Code, uh, was published in uh, 2017, while the second book uh, was published, uh, I think, at the end of last year, and it is called The Expected Goals Philosophy. Uh, I have uh, the two books here with me. But most importantly, we have uh, the author it's, uh, himself, uh, James Tippett. Hi, James. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time uh, to be here with us. So, James, uh, why don't you, first of all, introduce yourself and explain to us how you got to know the concept of expected goals? Um, so I guess my background started back in 2015, I think it was, when I started working at Smart Odds, which is an um, industry-leading gambling consultancy, um, and my role was to collect data for them uh, based on the expected goals method, which they would then use to uh, analyse and, and sell to professional gamblers. Um, and yeah, that from there I kind of got an insight into, into expected goals and how it can be used to scout players and how it can be used to... Uh, win money through gambling and and just generally give a better insight into into the footballing ability of teams and players um, and yeah just went from there really so james uh, let us start from the basic uh, which is your best definition of expected goals and uh, why do you think uh, it is so important the expected goals method is essentially a better way for us to analyze teams and players within football it's it it kind of breaks down football into attacking opportunities and, and the shots that both teams have. And the idea is that that gives a better indicator of the true performance level of teams than goals do because goals are such a random event and they're so, they're so rare. Um, I mean, I'm sure you, you, you've both seen your team uh, absolutely dominate football matches, take loads of shots, you know, completely batter the opposition, but then end up on the wrong side of the scoreline. Expected goal is essentially a way for accounting for, for that bad luck or, or the true ability of skill. Um, and yeah that, that, that's my best definition i guess okay great and uh, how uh, do the different models differ and uh, in your opinion uh, which are the best factors to include when building a model the main things that you should include in your expected goals model in, in terms of assessing shot quality is the number one determinant is obviously the position of the shot a shot from six yards out is going to have a much higher probability of, of succeeding than a shot from 40 yards out um, then there's so many other variables you can include in your model, such as uh, whether it's on the stronger or weaker foot of the player taking the shot, um, the position of the defenders and the goalkeepers, some more advanced models take, take into account that because obviously a shot into a crowded penalty area is less likely of achieving a goal than a shot into an open net. Um, the, the type of assist, so if the ball is pass through on the ground you're more likely to score than if it's you know bobbling or if it's a header um so yeah there's, there's a number of different variables that factor in when you're assessing shot quality so basically from what you from what you're saying it seems that uh, once uh, we used to just analyze the quantity of the shots while now with the uh, expected goals method uh, we are uh, able to go also the quality of the shots and to put that into the equation. Uh, and that, you know, is kind of revolutionary uh, from uh, the fans' point of view, but I guess also for, for the clubs, uh, the team's point of view and the players' point of view. Now, who do you expect to see in the next few years um, in football? What, what has happened in a basketball? I.e., in basketball, you know, there uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago, when uh, Michael Jordan was still, play, was still playing, you had a lot of uh, um, two-pointers. Uh, while now, you know, basketball players tend to shoot three-pointers way more often. Now, would you expect the same to happen in football? Like, uh, uh, instead of shooting outside of uh, the penalty box uh, to, see start, uh, to, see start, um, to see the players uh, starting to, 
to shoot uh, way more often from uh, inside the penalty box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think definitely to, uh, to put the answer simply, I think you're definitely starting to see that like more and more teams, there's already evidence that teams are starting to get closer to goal before they shoot, um, which the data shows is correct. If you, if you pass up poor shooting opportunities in search of better ones by working the ball closer to goal, you know, you think of Barcelona or Arsenal trying to, trying to pass the ball into the net, but really that, that, that is the way to do it. The data shows that um, you should really try and create the best chances possible rather than creating a high quantity of low quality opportunities. Um, the, the reason it differs from basketball, I'd say, is because I, I'm not a basketball fan. I have watched the Michael Jordan documentary, which is unbelievable, by the way. But um, in basketball, there's quite clearly defined lines, I guess, um, from which points are worth certain amounts whereas obviously in football a goal is a goal no matter where you score it from so I don't think that I don't think it'll be so pronounced um the the kind of obviousness of of the change in mentality but definitely uh in football I think you will start to see teams more and more um try and work the ball into better positions before shooting we are seeing the mainstream media starting to show this type of metrics and uh, would you expect uh, the visibility to increase in the next future? Yeah, definitely. I think when I, when I first learned about expected goals back in 2015, it was only really the, the gamblers who, who wanted to keep it secret, um, who used it obviously to win betting and, and also a few football clubs, I guess, in, in their player scouting. But all those people wanted to keep it under wraps so as not to eliminate that edge. Whereas now I think in 2017, big steps were taken, I'm not sure about Italy, but in the UK media by, by the BBC, who started presenting it on Match of the Day, and Sky started to incorporate it into their broadcasts. And, and I think it, it's a very hard thing to, I, I always think of expected goals as a language with, with which to speak about football and a more accurate language that you can talk about the game. And it's quite a hard language to learn and to understand and to teach people because people either aren't that interested or they don't see the need for it, or they just, they don't understand the revolutionary potential it could have. But I think slowly and slowly, we're beginning to integrate the language more into our everyday tongue, as it were. Um, and I definitely see the future being positive in terms of five or 10 years time. I can see it being a much more um, accepted discourse and uh, a more uh, integrated stat. Yeah, I think uh, there is uh, <clears throat> the natural course of uh, future events, uh, but that's my, my view. I mean, you wrote uh, this book, uh, the, the Football Code, in uh, 2017, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, the Expected Goals uh, philosophy uh, last year. In uh, these two years, uh, have, you, have you seen the approach of uh, professional football uh, changing much? Uh, or not? I mean, like, has uh, the world of football, the, the world of professional football evolved, not only on the expected goals, but on data analytics overall? Yeah, I think it's such a uh, dynamic landscape, the, the football data landscape, and there are always people come up with new things. And, and um, I'd say it's hard to know what goes on inside each specific club, because obviously they want to keep, keep their method secret uh, closely guarded not as as not to kind of eliminate that edge as i mentioned earlier but i think definitely in the outer realms um in the kind of media and the way fans talk about it i do think it's becoming more and more uh accessible and i do think uh the landscape is changing quite considerably so what will your next book uh, talk about? I don't, I don't think I've got a next book in me. I think I've exhausted all my knowledge, to be honest. We'll see in a couple of years if I, if I pick any new stuff up. And I guess we'll see how the analytical landscape changes. I know you guys are doing some very interesting stuff with uh, football analytics. And uh, maybe you've got more of a book in you than I do at this point. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Can you share uh, with us an example of, uh, I mean, given your experience at Smart Odds, I guess, uh, of how a top club uh, like Brentford or other could use the metric of expected goals uh, to gain a competitive advantage? I mean, is it more related to scouting? Is it more related to, I don't know, player development or stuff like that? I think you can definitely 
use it to give an insight to the performance level of your own team and your own players and see how they're performing and seeing what kind of scoring positions they're getting into. Um, I know uh, Brentford will never sack their manager if they've been on a poor run of results, but the expected goals data is positive, if, if that makes sense. So uh, a, couple of, a couple of their uh, recent managers got off to poor starts but, and were kind of... Uh, came under pressure from the fans but obviously the ownership and the management backed him because or backed them the, the two most recent managers because they their underlying stats show they're performing really well so I know that's one way that they use expected goals and, and other such data um the most obvious way I guess would be in scouting to kind of identify uh the hidden gems across Europe or, or England and and uh yeah sign really high quality players for rock bottom prices. Um, what I would say is obviously data is one component to that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of video scouting and kind of um, networking as well, which contributes to that. I don't think you can just scout players using data. It has to be there as a, uh, as a kind of uh, added component to, to the traditional scouting methods. But uh, yeah, there's definitely some really exciting stuff going on within a lot of football clubs. What is the difference uh, between the two books? I mean, obviously, the expected goal philosophy uh, is, is more focused on expected goals than the football code, I guess. But, uh, I mean, what are the other differences uh, between the two books? I guess the first book um, is more of a general approach to predicting football. Um, and it's way more broad. I think I almost try and do too much in it in terms of looking at uh, the kind of... The, kind of, the general themes of it are like looking at the everyday statistical uh, kind of errors we make, um, how our kind of biases affect how we assess football. Um, it looks at how we can like beat the bookmakers through gambling more um, kind of intelligently um, and finding edges and, and working out probabilities and generally taking a probabilist, probabilistic view of of football and obviously within that falls expected goals um and then the second book is much more codified work on on expected goals it kind of came about because i was at university and like everyone kept asking about expected goals i guess um from my first book and for because they've seen it on bbc and sky sports and stuff and i try and explain it to them but it's quite a hard concept to to explain uh verbally i guess and um and I just thought there was a massive market for one work which just completely outlined outlined rather um all the expected goals philosophy and and uh, how it can be utilized so that that's how the second one came about uh, do you, are you still in contact with people at Brentford or or not uh not so much now not not so much um i i wasn't I was just there collecting the data I was very low down in the company i didn't i wasn't part of that setup really at all. I was, so was smart thoughts and Brentford are really literally like almost one thing. I mean, in terms of, you know, the where, where the intelligent forms is the same office. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, exactly. The, the Brentford management work out of smart thoughts office a lot of the time. Um, okay. So it, it's just the whole, it's this whole same database of data um, is, is used for both, both purposes. And you basically only collect the data about shots, right? Yeah, just, just watching matches and collecting um, shot-based data. Shot-based data, that's mm -hmm. it. So it's, you know, even from a data gathering point of view, it's more efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. It's much quicker no? than having to track all the passes and all the dribbles. And Yeah, because I guess that's why the expected goals method is is so useful in my in my opinion because it, it just cuts through the core of football thinking like part, how much does possession and passes and tackles and stuff actually influence the outcome of the game like there's very little correlation like Leicester won the league a couple of years ago with literally the worst possession stats in the league um, and you know that that's it doesn't really give you much insight into who's playing better or or worse um, Whereas expected goals cuts right through to the core of football thinking. It's so intuitive. Like after matches, pundits are always talking about the scoring opportunities, you know, highlights, real shows, the highlights, reels show scoring opportunities. And um, yeah, and that's directly what the expected goals method measures. Well, James, cool. thank you very much. It has been a, a pleasure. It has been really interesting. Uh, congratulations for the two books. You know, uh, you're very young and you have already published two books. 
something that uh, it's difficult to accomplish uh, even when you are much older. Um, so uh, congratulations for that. And also because the two books are really interesting and uh, they talk about uh, a subject uh, which becomes increasingly interesting as uh, the public uh, starts uh, to grasp the concept. And I think uh, that is going to happen the, over the next few years. Uh, I hope at least, uh, because if that happens, then it means uh, that data analytics is a bit more public than it is today. And that uh, would be good for uh, the beautiful game, in my view. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much for having me on. And uh, yeah, I'm really interested in seeing how the work you do also influences uh, the, the nature of football analytics. So. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Ciao, James.